Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 28, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why we need to take the Alaska LNG project seriously. Second, the effort by some to apply revisionist history to the PFD. And third, our thoughts on Representative Tammy Wilson's comments on the show last week on HB 331, and why it is and will continue to be an issue for us in the upcoming election cycle. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Brad Keithley comes in to talk with us each and every uh, week about various issues surrounding us here in the state of Alaska and more. Uh, He is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, who you can find out there on Facebook and uh, and other places. Brad, good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm doing well. Are you are you still down at, quote unquote, home in state Brent and Cape Breton? (laughs) Now I came back to the West Coast last night. I'm in the. I'm in Seattle today. Okay, good. Well, you're close to your home in Oregon, so that's fine. I'm sure it'll be <laughs> it'll be fine. Uh, so, somebody, somebody sent me a comment said that I'm going to have to quit traveling so much. I'm I, I'm uh, I'm stirring up too many issues. Right. By, nobody can keep track. Music. Right. Nobody can keep track of where Brad Keithley is. He lives. He's a vagabond. The next thing you'll hear will be Brad Keithley doesn't have a house. He lives out of a suitcase in a camper trailer. That'll be the next. Uh, that'll be the next commentary. <laughs> Uh, Brad comes out every week to give us his top three, which are kind of the top three issues. And I might throw a fourth one in there today because I think there's some, uh, I think there's some really interesting stuff, but let's drill down into it a little bit here, Brad. Uh, the, the big, the big, uh, elephant in the room, so to speak, or maybe I should say dragon in the room is the connection between Alaska and China. There's some real big things at play here. Let's talk a little bit about what is happening uh, with uh, with China and Alaska, the trade delegation, and Governor Bill Walker. Well, Michael, I think the really interesting thing, the really what interesting have you been able dynamic to that's going on, on right now is the dealings between the Trump administration and China uh, over the trade deficit. There's about a $350 billion uh, plus or minus trade deficit. Uh, China exports to the U.S. The U.S. imports more from China uh, in goods and, in, in goods than China's buying from the U.S. To, to that tune, and that and that's something that the Trump administration increasingly has focused on uh, over the last several months uh, in trying to find a balance to that. They've the they're, the Trump administration is using the carrot and stick approach. Uh, the stick is the threat of tariffs on Chinese goods to increase their cost uh, and, and presumably decrease the, uh, the, the import of them into the U.S. or at least get some offset uh, by imposing tariffs and, and, uh, and using those tariffs to reduce the deficit, uh, the, trade, the trade deficit. Um, and so, so that, that's the stick approach and the carrot approach is the negotiations that the administration has been having with the Chinese uh, on various issues, uh, ZTE is one of them, but on, on various issues in an effort to uh, try to reduce the trade deficit. The, the the thing that affects Alaska is the latter, these negotiations that's going on between the administration and uh, 
um, and the Chinese over over various steps the Chinese could take to reduce the deficit by importing more uh, from the United States than they have been uh, traditionally in offsetting some of the trade imbalance that way. And one of the big things uh, that's been talked about is energy, uh, importing oil from the United States now that the United States is a net oil exporter, right? Uh, and and um, uh, importing LNG from the United States. Uh, once you start going down that route of of importing energy from the United States, Alaska comes into play. Comes into play for a couple of reasons. We because of location, um, uh, Alaska is well situated to to export LNG to the Chinese. Uh, and it comes into play because of size. The, the the size of the Alaska project on a world scale is large. And so uh, connecting that LNG export project to China uh, and having China uh, uh, import a significant amount of that LNG uh, would would generate a lot of dollars. Ten billion dollars. That doesn't seem like like a huge amount in a in a three hundred uh, uh Billion dollar uh, imbalance, um, but still, you know, you got to you got to have a lot of pieces together to uh, to make that work. And in ten billion dollars, which is what the Walker administration now is talking about as the potential offset uh, to the trade imbalance, is a, is a would be a big a big piece that you wouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, locating other places. So, right, I think I think I think that the LNG project. Uh, has sort of taken on an additional uh, seriousness and additional gravitas as a result of the Trump administration's efforts. Um, and frankly, I know that there's a lot of people in Alaska who have discounted the LNG project, who have talked about you know spending bad money uh, in in chasing down that chasing down that that rabbit hole. Uh, but frankly, I think because even if you didn't believe it before, I did. But even if you didn't believe that. LNG was a project that needed to be watched closely. Um, I think the Trump administration's efforts have 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 sort of crossed that barrier for everybody else. We need to be paying attention to this project. I was watching this and looking at the trade delegation, and I just it was like it was like lemmings and clowns it out of a clown car. I mean, it was every time I turn around, I see pictures of somebody else who was attached to this delegation. I mean, there was there was tons of people over there from you know folks from the brewery, Forty Ninth State Brewery, to Baby Foods to. You know, live king crab flying people in over there. It just, I mean, all kinds of tourism. I saw Fair, Explore Fairbanks was part of it. Uh, I mean, there's a huge contingent over there. Uh, we see China as a fertile marketplace for a lot of our goods and services and things that are uniquely Alaska, which I, I guess could be good because a lot of things are opening up in China. But I'm a little concerned about, quite honestly, the nature of China's politics and their government and how they do things. Let me just read uh, you and I. There was an article in uh, Bloomberg <clears throat> that uh, we were taking a look at and discussing, and, and let me just let me just read this one uh, this one uh, uh, paragraph out of it that just caught my attention and really made me uh, think about it. Uh, it talks about um, minerals and mining opportunities, according to Walker could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, he said, citing a report and a visit to an Alaska gold mine that sends all of its output to China. Now, if you've been doing any reading on China or anything else, you understand that they have been buying up and and, and hoarding gold supplies for a long time. And, of course, you and I have talked a lot about the petrol yuan, the vulnerability of the dollar, and many other things. To me, this is just one more indicator of Somebody in China has got some brains on this deal. Uh, it just concerns me, I guess, putting all of our eggs into this one basket and tying ourselves so closely to the Chinese communist state. What do, What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, obviously, you need to be careful if you tie up with any major market. I mean, let's say, let's just pick a, a stupid example. Let's let's pick a, 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 a Chile. If you right. put all of your eggs in the basket uh, with chili, uh, you would you would you would be concerned because you know the the Chileans uh, uh, might go off on a tangent some in some other direction and and sort of drag you along with them if your economy was tied to them. So you, 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 there, at some level, you you need to have that concern with with any market you're tied into. Here here's the challenge. 
The challenge is the Chinese market is huge. It is, and it is growing from an LNG standpoint. Let's focus on LNG. From an LNG standpoint, it is, it is the growth market. It is the opportunity. If you, don't, if you aren't already locked in, if you don't have, any, have an existing LNG project that's locked in with the market, China is sort of where the, where the, the name of the game is these days. India, to some degree, but frankly, India is out of our reach and, and, and would be too expensive for us to try to be in the Indian market. We're, we're well positioned with China. It's a growing market. It's a growing opportunity. They're trying to reduce uh, their dependence on coal. They're trying to clean up their air. They're trying to uh, uh, do a lot of things that, would, that encourages LNG growth. And in fact, if you look at current LNG prices, they're fairly robust. They're not back up to the $14 and $15 level that we saw uh, in a previous time, but they're fairly robust. They're $9, $10 uh, uh, in the $9, $10 range. And that's because Chinese demand is, is lifting the market uh, and, and, and lifting market prices. If, right. you look at, uh, if you look at projections of demand growth uh, for LNG, they're fairly substantial, but it's all China. So the, the, the challenge to us is, yes, there's a problem. Um, there, there's, 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 there are issues around locking into a given market and becoming very closely tied to that market. Uh, but that's where the game is. And, and if we want to have uh, an LNG project, and we should uh, in this state because of the, because of the fiscal impacts, if, if nothing else, if we want to have an LNG market, that's where that market is. Um, and so uh, pursuing that market, I, you know, we could say we're going to pursue India or we could say we're going to pursue incremental growth in Korea or incremental or we're going to displace people, displace other suppliers out of the Japanese market. We can say that, but the realism of that is, is very low. The realistic opportunity for Alaska is, uh, is in China. So, we need to go in it with eyes wide open. We need to go in it with care, uh, but but we need to go in it because that's that's where the opportunity is. Let me ask you a question. Harold makes a comment, which I think goes back to, again, China's interest in tying themselves to Alaska. Harold says, China isn't going to pay for overpriced LNG to balance trade. There is decades of global supply at low prices. You answer part of that by saying the Chinese demand is now driving those global supply supply uh, uh, numbers up and, and the pricing up. But this makes me wonder, is this one of the reasons why China is so hot to tie itself to Alaska in this way by helping to finance the pipeline? to guarantee a lower than market price for that gas in the future moving forward. I don't think that that we're looking at at lower than than market price uh, for Alaska. Now, you and I have had this conversation before. Alaska needs to make sure that we include the producers uh, in these negotiations. Uh, Alaska uh, can hire all the outside talent at once, but when it comes down to it, the producers are the ones who are best situated to to identify and drive uh, the price for the resource and to get the maximum price for the resource. So Alaska needs to include those producers. I don't think the producers, because the producers are going to have to invest to to as well to to maintain the supply. I don't think the producers are going to agree to a price that that is not uh, market driven where i where i think the opportunity why i think all this is working together is this there are a lot of lng suppliers in the world there's a lot of prospective lng uh, uh, projects out there that would that would like to meet the chinese market canada has some bc has some um but what it what president trump has done and i'm Generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of President Trump on, on fiscal issues. I, we've increased the deficit. You and I have talked about that. But on this issue, uh, I'm, I'm, becoming, I'm becoming a bigger fan. What President Trump has done uh, is he's brought the force of the American market uh, into play uh, in confronting the Chinese on this issue. The Chinese don't want to lose the American market, certainly, uh, uh, as, a, as an outlet for their goods and services. So – what what the president has done is is sort of created a tiebreaker, if you will, for American projects in dealing with the Chinese. Yes, Australia potentially could leverage up, uh, uh, could expand projects down there. Yes, Canada uh, uh, could have 
uh, of projects. Yes, Mozambique uh, has a huge source of supply and, and is a potential supplier. But what the president is doing is is por- sort of putting the thumb on the scale and saying, look, we've got this huge trade deficit with you, with you, China. We want you to buy America, American goods to help offset that trade deficit. Um, and, and so I don't think it's the case where Alaska is going to have to end up giving a below market price. I think, I think we're going to, I, I, I think we're going to be able to, if we include the producers, I think we're going to be able to negotiate uh, a good price. I think we win uh, in, in this competition this global competition for supply to China uh, because of the, the, the president putting the pressure on the Chinese to, uh, to develop uh, American, American supplies. So I, I, I don't think the Chinese are viewing Alaska as an opportunity to get below market goods. Um, I think they're viewing it as a way of dealing with the pressure the president's brought uh, on, on trade issues. In the long run, where do you, I mean, where do you see this ending up for us with China when it's all said and done? Let's wrap up this part of it. Um, again, I'm still concerned. I understand what you're saying about we have to watch every market, uh, regardless of who we hook up with. But it, the last few months, I've been doing a lot more reading on Xi Ping, the kind of his overall philosophy. It's a very Maoist philosophy. Um, and, and I get concerned about that in the long term. I mean, China, obviously the biggest market. We should be a player with them in some way. Uh, how hard should we be pushing for diversification into other markets and other things? But, I mean, where does this leave us when it's all said and done? Kind of wrap this up for us. Well, Michael, I think I think we don't know yet, but I think in five years we very well could see a situation in which China has become an investor in the Alaska LNG project, is participating in the financing of the Alaska LNG project, is going has entered into contracts, uh, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, is over in in China uh, or headed over to China to talk about uh, the the trade issues and is focused on getting contracts. He wants he wants contracts and and I think in five years we could very well see a, a firmed up contract with China that 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 has them investing, has them as a significant uh, uh, customer of Alaska LNG uh, and Alaska LNG progressing down the road. Now again that. We need to be very careful about doing that. The producers need to be involved. We need to have uh, uh, their uh, insights and their participation in making sure we maximize uh, the resource uh, takeaway from this, because that's where Alaska gets its money uh, out of this after the initial construction booms over. The long term is in is in the value of the resource. We need to have the producers involved. But I, I there's a confluence of events going on. Very well could blow up, but a confluence of events going on uh, that I think make this project uh, much more realistic than than people have thought. Uh, I wouldn't normally take another bite at the apple, but Harold has put such a provocative comment in here, I have to read it. Qatar is in a price war. They're going to protect market share, and Brad is 100% wrong. Brad Keithley, your response. Uh, I don't know. Harold's wrong. <laughs> 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 Gutter's gutter gutter is has a lot of LNG is is trying to uh, is trying to take advantage of that. But look where gutter is. Gutter is in the Middle East. Uh, India is where you're going to see a lot of gutter supply go. Europe is where you're going to see a lot of gutter supply go. Gutter's really in a price war, or to some degree, with the Russians uh, trying to bring uh, pipeline gas into Europe. That's a big part of of gutter's market. Uh, I, you know, everybody can have an opinion on this because nothing, nothing's firmed up. Uh, but if you read the, the trade press, if you talk to the people in the industry, as I try to do, uh, if you keep your ear close to the ground on the, on, on what's going on here, uh, I think Trump's serious about getting a resolution to the imbalance of trade. Uh, if he's serious about that energy has to be, be a big part of that. I mean, that's where the dollars, it's where you get a lot of dollars quickly, uh, and if energy is a big part of that, Alaska LNG certainly makes a, a, a lot of sense uh, as part of that conclusion. So I, I, I think we're I think in five years we're headed toward a deal. Now, again, Harold, we've never said that Brad is omnipotent, but he, he's been right for most of the stuff. So don't you know, it's OK. You can be wrong sometimes, but I, I have to agree in watching this very closely. I think it's a good I think it's a good idea. Let's move on to your number two point today, which is. The misleading of Alaskans by a lot of our quote-unquote leaders, um, and we're seeing that more and more, specifically 
this letter that keeps floating. This is the gift that just keeps on giving is this this uh, email <laughs> from Senator Kathy Geisel, who, you know, threw out there. I mean, first of all, they threw out there that you don't even live in the state anymore, which I thought was hysterical. But then they started talking again about uh, the 50 50 split, how that's non-existent, how it's never. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation. And it seems to me it 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 it, it really is almost the definition of fake news being passed around again. Yeah, it's I you know, the Senate. I, I don't want to say they're scrambling because I don't think they're scrambling, but they're they're starting to make stuff up uh, as a way of of defending their position. So Geisel's letter to um, uh, Bill Topol, which is which is the the one we're talking about, uh, and we've got it posted uh, uh, on our Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. It may be down a few levels by now, but but it's there. Uh, th- that that uh, letter. Uh, makes the claim that uh, Alaskans or, or 50-50 was never the policy, that, right. that 50% of the permanent fund earnings going to uh, the uh, to shareholders and, or to, to citizens and 50% going to uh, uh, the state for state government was never was never contemplated, never the policy. And 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 she set she uses that to set up and say, well. Now that we now that government has to start drawing on the earnings reserve account, we need to relook at what the allocation is. We need to relook at that 50 percent going to uh, the citizens. And we're looking at it fresh because it never was the policy that that's just wrong. I mean, it's and 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 you have to ignore a lot of history to to make that claim. Hammond uh, in diapering the devil. Uh, which uh, was written toward the end of his life and then published posthumously uh, after he after he died. But but Hammond made clear that his the purpose behind the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend was this: I wanted to transform oil wells pumping oil for a finite period into money wells pumping money for infinity. Okay, that's the setup right. of the permanent fund. We're going to take. We're going to take revenues from oil. We're going to put it in investments. We're going to create money wells from these investments, earnings, uh, and that it would pump for infinity. And then he goes on to say, and once the money wells were pumping, each year, one half of the account's earnings would be dispersed among Alaska's residents. The other half of the earnings could be used for essential government services. That was the vision uh, from the outset. Uh, behind uh, the permanent fund and the use and the use of, of permanent fund earnings, the PFD uh, was created by statute in the early 1980s. Uh, it explicitly says 50% of the earnings calculated according to the statute uh, will be distri- will be uh, 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 distributed by the permanent fund corporation to the permanent fund division. The permanent fund division will then they create another statute that told the permanent fund division how to how to uh, uh, distribute uh, those earnings, but it says explicitly 50% um, consistent with with Hammond's goal. Now it doesn't say, I suppose. I suppose what Senator Giesel and others try to glom onto is it doesn't say, and the remaining is available for government. But the Constitution says that the second sentence of the amendment that that created the permanent fund says that the earnings are are part of the are, are part of the general fund. And as part of the general fund, they can be distributed by, uh, they can be appropriated uh, uh, by the legislature. So the statute, the Constitution says earnings are part of the general fund. The statute says 50% of those earnings will be will be used or, or designated uh, for the PFD. The other 50% is available in the general fund, according to the Constitution, <laughs> and, and can be used can be used by government. So well. th- th- this whole this whole argument that the 50-50 wasn't the initial plan. Um, it's just, I, it, 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 they're, being, they're making it out a whole cloth. Maybe she's confused because it's a statute and, you know, they've never seen a statute that they could really understand. <laughs> so maybe that's what it's all about. Uh, I mean, this, it, it, this is insanity. I mean, we're seeing this kind of, uh, this kind of, you know, word bending and, you know, kind of this, you know, verbal gymnastics from a lot of the, uh, a lot of the leadership on both the house and the Senate side, where they try to in my opinion, obfuscate and inveigle 
the public into thinking that th- this really isn't is you know it's not, this is not the these aren't the droids you're looking for kind of thing. They're trying to Jedi mind trick us and basically say that's not really what was intended. Uh, just basically counting on the fact that most of Alaskans haven't read the words of Hammond or Tillian or Halford or any of these other people who were there when this was all going on, who were there during the discussion, who's actually wrote and and have read the statute, and so most people just. They assume that what they're being told is correct, and that is that is part of the problem. Karen says liars lie, and I, and I agree. That's at this point they're doing it, and they're doing it for their own ends. Quite honestly, there's there's another exchange I've been having uh, with a commentator on Facebook who essentially has been arguing that that the PFD was a creature of a t- of a time when we had surplus revenues, and and Hammond was was the, all of his talk and his advice and his counsel and all of his words around the permanent fund dividend ought to be taken in the context of this time uh, when we had uh, uh, surplus revenues. And, and, and so they're trying to isolate the permanent, I mean, the purpose of those comments is to try to isolate the permanent fund dividend to, to only those, those periods when we have, when we have uh, excess revenues. But that's wrong also. I mean, if you read Diapering the Devil, again, I... I, I, I'm not into anybody commanding anybody else to do something, but if anybody really wants to take part in this debate, uh, they need to read Diapering the Devil. They at right. least need to to understand what Hammond had in mind. If you read Diapering the Devil, there are there's there's a description, and again, this is written uh, late in 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 the governor's life. There's a description of the various times through Alaska's history from 1980 on when he had to defend the permanent fund dividend, the 1990s, the late 1990s, uh, when uh, uh, when we went out for a, an advisory vote, when Governor Knowles went out for an advisory vote on whether the uh, PFD statute should be changed, the 2004 Conference of Alaskans, uh, Governor Murkowski had convened this conference uh, in the midst of, a, of another fiscal crisis to try to identify steps that the state ought to take. Uh, to deal with the fiscal crisis, one of them was to make changes in the PFD, and and Governor Hammond writes throughout uh, of 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 his constant and continual uh, uh, defense of the permanent fund dividend. So it isn't his defense, his words, his comments, his vision uh, isn't isolated to this early 1980s period. Uh, and can be and can be ignored now that we're no longer in a period of surplus revenues. Hammond was consistent. Through both th- through thick and thin, through both good financial uh, uh, periods and bad financial periods, that we needed to maintain the PFD. That video that we talked uh, about last week um, on the show, and and you had a, and you have on your Facebook site uh, site from the from the show, um, uh, that video, uh, Governor Hammond said he, he he's come to the conclusion that there are no circumstances under which the PFD should be cut. And, right. and the reason is very simple. The reason is the PFD has the biggest bang for the buck in terms of, of, of its impact on the overall economy, and it's hugely important to Alaska families. The ICER analysis uh, just two years ago uh, reaffirms that. Um, and so it's not one of these things it, – it, it's almost one of these things that when, when the fiscal situation's worse, when Alaska's in a recession, you need the PFD more because of the bang for the buck it has in the overall Alaska economy and because of the support it has uh, for, uh, for Alaska families. It's not the case, as some, would have, as some are trying to convince others, that we should isolate it just to these periods of financial surplus. So it's, I, I mean, we have a lot of people out there trying to write revisionist history uh, around the PFD, trying to claim that the PFD is something it's not, or is, or is, is it, it wasn't really intended to, to to be as it played out. I mean, Senator Machecki goes around talking about, well, we ought to cap the PFD. Nobody ever thought the PFD was gonna was gonna grow this large. Well, yes, they did. Right. right. I mean, you 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 look back again at estimates of where the PFD was going to go. You look back at Governor Hammond's words. Yes, they thought it could be uh, could become a a not insignificant part of of a family's income. And they were good with that. They liked that because of the impact it had uh, both on the overall Alaska economy uh, and on the strength of Alaska families. So whenever I hear somebody say, well, the PFD wasn't intended to do this or do that, or it was only it's only intended to be isolated at this period of time, or it was never intended to be 50-50, go back and look 
as a sports broadcaster in Washington, D.C., I used to follow, used to say, go back and look at the videotape. Go back and look at, at, uh, at what Governor Hammond said. Go back and read Diapering the Devil, uh, and you will see that we are exactly where he anticipated, well, not the last two years we've, we've cut it, but that the PFD uh, at 50% is exact, exactly where he anticipated it right. to be. Well, and you, you don't even have to go back that far in history. Clock to Clem Tillian. Talk to some of the people that are still around that were there. When this all went down, and that was exactly what was intended. And and I guess this comes back to the bigger issue, Brad, of our, again, I keep using the term loosely with air quotes, leaders have decided that they are going to fix the narrative. They're going to say that this all has to be for government. And again, it's all at the protection of the public sector uh, in at the detriment of the private sector. And that kind of continues to be the theme uh, throughout uh, pretty much both sides, left and right, donkeys and elephants, their talking points is that we're going to protect the public sector at all costs. This is a very, very, uh, this is a very, very tough situation. It is. I, I mean, we, we've gotten to the point, we've spent ourselves, we've built programs to a point where when oil's down, we no longer can fund it fully from oil. And and even if you add in 50% of the, of the permanent fund earnings, as Governor Hammond envisioned, you're still in a deficit situation. So they got themselves into, into this rock and hard place of uh, uh, either we can't or we're not willing to or, or something about making the additional cuts to spending necessary to get us back into some sort of, of long-term balance. Uh, and so you're confronted with the need for new revenues. And, and the new revenues could come from one of three places. They could either come from oil by raising oil taxes, or they could come from, of, uh, they could come from cutting the PFD uh, which largely falls on the middle and lower, the impact of that largely falls on middle and lower income Alaskans uh, and on the overall Alaska economy. Or uh, you can go to some sort of tax. Uh, we advocate a flat tax because we think that's the fairest and the least uh, uh, harmful to the overall Alaska economy and to Alaska families. Um, and But, you know, you would have the top 20 percent uh, of Alaskans uh, by income paying some sort of tax. And, and frankly, what, what our, quote, leaders are doing is they're searching for the weakest link, right? They're searching for the one, uh, which, one of those three, that, uh, uh, three options, oil, PFD, or uh, 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 taxes, uh, uh, broad-based taxes. They're searching for which, ones, which one uh, is, is, has the least defense. Oil certainly has a strong defense, and, and frankly, I think they're right. We shouldn't be raising oil taxes at this point. Right. Um, uh, 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 taxes of some sort, uh, flat tax income tax, affects the top 20%. Uh, and, and since that's the donor class to a lot of these politicians, uh, they certainly are hearing from their donors, well, don't tax, don't, don't impose taxes. And so that sort of leaves the PFD, and the PFD – affects it has the largest adverse effect on the overall Alaska economy, but that's mainly because of the impact it has on middle income Alaskans and lower income Alaskans. And they don't have the lobbying force uh, that either oil or the top 20% has. So they're trying to find the weakest link. They think they found it in the PFD and they just, they just keep going in that direction. The problem is it has the largest adverse effect on the overall Alaska economy <laughs> and is by far the costliest to Alaska families. So yeah, it may not it may have the not have the strongest voice since you know, but it has the biggest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. And from a policy standpoint, it's just it's the last thing that that our policy leaders should be doing. But because they are politicians uh, uh, trying to look for weakest link, it's the first thing they're going to. I'm reminded of Yamamoto's comment after Pearl Harbor, where he says something along the lines of "You have awoken a sleeping dragon." Um, you know, and I can only hope that that is actually the case here, that, that they have awoken the sleeping dragon and that the people of Alaska are going to rise up and have something to say about this. We're talking with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget here on the Michael Duke Show. Uh, we've been talking about uh, some of the commentary and some of the actions of our leaders in the legislature who continue to treat the PFD as if it's a, you know, again, revisionist history as if it's just disposable income for the government. Final thoughts on this, Brad, as we move forward. This, to me, is a is a, is a troubling trend. And like I said, I hope the Alaskan people are now up in arms about it uh, enough that it really wakes them up. I mean, you said they think they found the easy road in tapping the PFD. I hope we show them that it's not the easy road. And, in fact, it is still the political third rail in Alaskan politics. 
Well, I certainly hope that too from a political standpoint, Michael. But but my focus uh, has been much more on what's the right policy, what's the right economic policy right. for Alaska, what's the right thing to do for Alaska families. And the thing that drives me uh, is is the ICER analysis. I mean, the most recent thing is the ICER analysis of 2016, but that's consistent with with the economic analyses throughout Alaska's history uh, since the since the PFD was first adopted, which is that, that the PFD is a big component of our overall economy. Uh, it is cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy. It's by far the costliest to Alaska families. And from a policy standpoint, especially in a recession, especially in a recession, it's just absolutely the wrong step to take. I understand the political forces at play, and I understand that that, that the other two potential outcomes, oil and uh, – well, the other three potential outcomes, cutting spending, oil, and, um, and, and income or sales taxes, all have strong lobbyists down in, uh, in Juneau. And I understand why people – why legislators are caving on those issues – but for me, you're doing it at the expense of the overall Alaska economy, and you're doing it at the expense of, of, of Alaska families. That's just wrong. So, yes, hopefully the sleeping giant will awake. Hopefully we will defend the PFD. But if, you, if you're at all concerned about the Alaska economy, the overall Alaska economy, not just the oil sector, not just the NEA sector, not just this or that sector that, that, that the lobbyists protect, uh, if you're worried about the overall Alaska economy, um, uh, then you've got to be a defender of the PFD because that's that's part of what makes the Alaska economy work. All right, we continue now with Brad Casey wrapping down to his weekly top three. I might have one short surprise at the end to discuss with him as well. But of course, your your third big one was last week. We had Tammy Wilson on the program. Uh, we had some discussions. Uh, it seemed like she had gotten some information that maybe she hadn't seen before. Uh, but she did explain her vote on 331. Um, I understand her reasoning, not that I agree with it. I do understand her reasoning in some other discussions. You've had a chance now to listen to that podcast and go back and 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 and, and analyze it. What are your thoughts on Tammy Wilson's discussion and talking points with HB 331? Well, I think our fundamental disagreement is on its impact on Alaskans. I, I mean, Tammy defended it by saying, for example, the the money – that we're paying out will be reinvested in Alaska. That was a big, that was a big issue to her. Uh, that that the, the bill had been amended over over the course of its uh, trajectory through the legislature to require uh, if you're if uh, if a recipient was going to take this money under certain circumstances that they had to reinvest it. Um, I, I understand I understand that motivation, but the fundamental the fundamental difference between Tammy and I is is whether. Uh, 331 costs Alaskans. Right. And that all goes back to this debate that Ed King and I had uh, about whether or not uh, we're actually going to save the money, uh, the difference between what we're paying out uh, in the front years under these bonds as opposed to what we would paid out, would have paid out under the statute, if we're actually going to save that money. Because it only makes economic sense to Alaskans. It only costs Alaskans the same um, uh, uh, if uh, if you save that money and then in, and, and invest that savings and then use it in the later years to pay off the debt uh, and the interest when it starts accruing, if you've got this pot, pot of money you've saved uh, and and then you only draw it out in the later years when uh, when the debt starts accruing, then Ed's analysis is that it makes money. But if you don't do that, if you don't save that pot of money, uh, then the analysis that he agreed with. Uh, is that it costs Alaskans, as you said to Tammy, uh, between a hundred million dollars if you only if you only blow half of it, or nine hundred million dollars uh, if you if you spend all of that savings and and don't save it. And and I think, as you explained to Tammy, and as I think is the case, uh, we're going to blow that savings. We're not going to save it. We're going to spend it on other things. In well, fact, I think we already did. Yeah, she even admitted after. that. I even asked her, I said, do you think that she goes, oh, no, I didn't assume that they were going to save that. Well, that's part of the problem. Well, that 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 is the problem. That's yeah. the whole problem. Be- because once once you once you start spending uh, what otherwise uh, what otherwise some people assumed would, was going to be saved, once you start spending that, you start going down in the hole and you start hitting uh, uh, future Alaskans with this huge bill, uh, that uh, d- additional bill, uh, 
uh, that that you didn't need to if you would have if you would have just paid out according to the remaining statute. So so when she says when she says, well, the money's going to be reinvested in Alaska, and that's a good thing, and, and we're going to get all these benefits out of it. Well, you have to you have to look at it. Is the, are the benefits we're going to get out of that reinvestment worth the cost? Worth the nine hundred million dollars uh, of additional cost we're going to incur uh, in going down this road? No one did that analysis during the session, uh, and in fact, that's that's sort of the same theory that this whole program got developed under uh, from the outset, that we're, oh, we're going to generate all this additional money by subsidizing these producers. They're going to go out and develop things. They're going to produce more oil, uh, and we're going we're to get all this money back. Well, the anal- when you go through and look at the history of the program, that didn't happen. Right. Yes, you can find one, one or two projects that produced a little bit more oil, but overall for the program as a whole, uh, we, the state went into the hole. We lost money. If you look at it as an investment, we lost money on that investment. So when you talk about when you talk about justifying this decision on yes, we're going to generate this additional activity, the question needs to be asked needed to be asked again: Is that going to pay? Is that going to pay for itself? Is it going to? Is that sort of additional activity going to produce a return on this additional nine hundred million dollars we're going to go into the hole on? Nobody did the analysis. Um, and, and if you're counting on things like Kalis, uh the Smith Bay project, which is way the heck out to the west, uh, I think you're counting on on very foolish things. Um, I mean, they, they've drilled two wells out there. They've done some analysis that tells them that they may have a whole lot of oil, uh, but that's sort of the same analysis that someone did once in the Cook Inlet and said, "Hey, there's a whole lot more oil in the Cook Inlet." Well, turns out there wasn't because the Cook Inlet's very fractured. Uh, we don't know what the hell's going on out in Smith Bay. It's a long way away out there anyway. So if you're if you're counting on if you're counting on additional revenues coming from those sorts of projects, pencil it out. Tell us when it's going to be. Show us the reality. Show us the basis for assuming uh, that sort of additional revenue, and then compare that to the cost yeah. that we're going to be incurring by going down this bond road. We didn't. This so. This reminds me of the broken window fallacy writ large. You know, hey, we're spending lots of money. Lots of money's flying back and forth. But what is the net result? What have we actually produced? What have we gotten? What have we received for that money? Uh, and as you said, doing it as a cost benefit analysis, nobody is doing that. You know, that was the whole problem with the tax credits, the oil tax credits. Looking at it as an investment, it was a piss poor investment. Now we're going to cost a hundred million to a billion dollars more. What is it? Go- what are we going to receive for it? Again, nobody can nobody can really analyze that and pencil it out. And the question becomes: Should government be in the business of picking winners and losers in that? And I think that the answer is no. But well, the the, the history of the old tax credit program is exactly old. it's no <laughs> because because we haven't done it, and now we've just sort of re-upped into that program by by engaging in this bond approach, which is going to cost Alaskans. It, 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 unless unless something happens to save this money that that's otherwise not required to be saved, it's going to cost Alaskans another, as you put it with Tamia, up to a, a, in in the direction of a billion dollars. We've we've just sort of re-upped into that program again for the second time without doing without doing this hard analysis of whether it's worth the investment. And I I just don't think it is. So Tammy Tammy had some good. If you assume if you assume that the program is cost neutral. If you assume that it's not going to have this adverse impact, then then Tammy's arguments start making sense. But if you go into the numbers and 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 I and and look at the numbers and come to the determination as I and others have done that that we can lose a whole lot more money out of the out of the way we're doing this, then no, none, none of the reasons that Tammy gave make sense. So this this all begins and ends at the analysis of at the at the question of whether it's going to cost Alaskans more, I think the answer is yes. And and frankly, Michael, it's something I'm going to talk about through the entire campaign because I think I think what happened was the legislature made a rush to judgment on this issue. They went down a road that the oil lobbyists were telling them uh, they should the the oil lobbyists and the oil field service lobbyists were telling them was a good road. And and I don't think they looked at the numbers. And unfortunately, it was Republicans who made that decision. Right. So I, it's it's a it's an it's an issue 
that uh, I'm going to continue talking about I'm gonna, and I'm going to continue talking about during the entire campaign. Uh, Tammy and I continue to talk about this vote uh, after the show, and we've texted back and forth. And, and she's actually now gone out, and I've sent her all the information and numbers that you pulled down and the discussion with Ed King and everything else. And and so I think you know, maybe it's a little too late. Maybe the horse is out of the barn, and we're slapping the lock on it now. But uh, you know, maybe we're a little bit more eyes wide open on this kind of thing, and we can we can move forward with it. I mean, I just can't see how this is going to – uh, play out. Maybe this makes her a stalwart defender of those dollars before they leave, and maybe she uses this analysis moving forward on any future spending that would spend those savings, um, which, uh, again, is to me an astronomical problem when you're talking about a billion dollars on our grandchildren. Um, and, and, you know, and again, coming due, all of it coming due at the same time that our presenter's obligations balloons up as well. It really spells, I mean, it's it's the perfect storm for a big financial catastrophe in another 10 years and that is really part of the well, problem well and, and sort of the sad thing about this michael is i sort of feel like i'm i'm back in the 2010 2011 2012 2013 era uh, you know talking about hey the way we're going the way the way this government's spending the the, the when, when you look at the projections of things when you look at oil prices and oil production and other things we're going to hit a big problem in the in the late 20 teens and the early 2020s the drop in oil prices accelerated that we hit it in the in the middle 20 teens as opposed to as opposed to the late 20 teens but you could see this stuff coming right and and we talked about it and we had legislators paying lip service to it but when they got down to Juneau, they just kept spending um and and spend us right into this problem well i i sort of feel like i'm back in that same time frame with this issue you can see this coming. You can see what the consequences of this is going to be. Tammy said, well, you know, debt's going down. Well, yeah, if we don't take on any more debt, it's going <laughs> down. But the, but, but the contractors are pushing for a GO bond to have more, you know, capital spending. Um, uh, and there's all, and, and school, we've, we've taken away uh, the subsidy for school funding. And now we're going to start having people claim that we have to, you know, schools are deteriorating. We're going to have to fund those. There's, there's going to be pressures for bonds to assume that we're not going to have any more bonds between now and the mid 2020s. It's just a foolish assumption. So right. I, I, well, I it's not a good way like to, I'd, it's not a good way to base policy. Hey, our debt ratio is low. Let's go borrow some more. That, I mean, that, again, in a recession, it's not great policy. It's not. And, 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 and I'm sitting here feeling the same way I felt in the early, you know, in, in, in the 2010 to 2014 timeframe and just shaking my head about why we're doing this. We got here and now everybody's in the middle of this and they're going, Oh God, you know, why did we spend all that money? Well, guys, you're doing it again. Right. And, and, and we're going to be sitting here in the middle of the, in the, in the mid 2020s. And I'm going to be sitting in Alaska, by the way, we're going to be sitting <laughs> here in the middle 2020s. Um, uh, shaking our head again. Gosh, why didn't we? Why did we do things differently? Right. In the, well, in the late twenty ten. And the so. only difference is, is back then at least we had the cash on hand. Now we're spending money we don't have. Uh, you know, in the future, and not sure we're even going to have it then. So I mean, it's it's a little different, but it's the same. In fact, it's worse when it's all said and done. Well, we're we're we're, we're borrowing from our children. Uh, we're 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 leaving. It's the same thing as if you and I ran out and ran up our credit card bills, uh, you know, to, to make our lifestyle better and then handed it over to our kids and said, Hey, you get to pay the tab for this. It's all you. I know you didn't get any of this. Yeah. I know you didn't get any of the stuff, but you get to pay the tab. That's right. You know, we're just, we're just borrow, we're borrowing. We're taking the money from our children. Right. Well, this is a perfect segue to my final question. I'm letting you run a little long here. I don't have Chris story today, so I wanted to run you a little bit long. Uh, and yet was your weekly top three. I want to add a fourth to your top three uh, because you posted about this the other day. And I think that what you just said is a perfect segue because, again, a monkey see, monkey do. As we're doing in Alaska, so has the national government been doing for years. And it looks like we've got another budget battle coming down. This one under President Trump, where he is pre he's basically told Congress he will never sign another one foot thick trillion dollar spending bill. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But basically, he's setting us up for the showdown in October where the annual spending bill is going to come to a grinding halt. All we've ever had is a continuing resolution for a dozen plus years. No real budget, no real analysis and no real thought going into it, and we're we're up for some pain here if we don't uh, figure out exactly what we're doing. 
Right. So what causes that? What causes that crisis in October is that the fiscal, the federal fiscal year runs out. It runs out on September 30th, and so the authority that's contained that's contained in the bills that have been passed, the spending bills that have been passed, runs out on that date. The the theory is that during the year that you're spending the money, you're working on next year's budget, uh, and that you pass all of the spending bills, all the appropriation bills, by October 1. They go into effect, and government keeps on functioning under the under the new budget. The problem is Congress hasn't come to a come to a full budget by October one for I, I, I forget the number, but it's a huge number of years. Right. And and so you get to October one, you have no you have no new spending bill authorizations, uh, and so you start running into things like the continuing resolution. Uh, we're going to be in the middle of a. We, we are not on track to spend to, to pass all the authorization bills. I don't. There's not any authorization bill. The, the House Ag bill, the Ag bill was on the floor, uh, but it got defeated. The Democrats and the Freedom Caucus uh, both voted against it, so it got defeated. I don't think there's any spending authorization bill that's made it certainly beyond one body uh, uh, to the made it beyond the House to the to the Senate yet. So we're we're running we're run, we're right on schedule to run into this crash uh, at the end of the year to not have any authorization bills um, or or all or all of the authorization bills ready to go on October one, uh, and so we run into this this whole crisis, and and nothing it doesn't look like Congress is really all that concerned about it. I mean, for the first time in forever, we don't even have a budget. Right. Uh, Congress isn't even working on a budget. Uh, uh, that's supposed to set the overall cap uh, of what of what government spending is supposed to be. Uh, that's usually done by April, or the, the statute requires it's done by April. It's lagged uh, uh, several times over the past uh, 40 years or so, but they've always finally gotten to one house or the other has finally gotten to a budget. Neither house is is pro, neither body is progressing a budget right now. So it 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 we we are we are heading toward another October where uh, we're not going to have uh, the spending bills in place. The question is what we're going to do about it at that point. And, and nobody really knows right now. I just Googled it. Uh, it. There's only been four years out of the last 40 where we haven't faced a continuing resolution. Uh, I mean, that's, oh that, <laughs> you start thinking about that. That is pretty brutal when it's all said and done. We have not got our fiscal house in order and it's no wonder that there's 20, 25 plus states who are now facing tremendous budget deficits because, again, it's monkey see, monkey do at this point. It is. And and it's, it's, it's only getting worse. I mean, the CBO came out, Congressional Bus Budget Office came out with a new analysis uh, last week that, that looked at the president's proposed budget. Uh, they analyzed the proposed budget in the course of Congress, uh, presumably taking up their own budget. Um, the president had uh, come up with a budget, and even his, but even the administration's proposed budget didn't balance at any point during the ten-year period. We were still running annual deficits, lower annual deficits, but we were still running annual deficits at the end of at the end of the ten-year period. CBO came in and said, as you would expect, uh, the administration had made several rosy assumptions about economic growth and other things, <laughs> and that the actual picture was much worse. There's, there is, there is, this is the first time, I think I'm correct on this, this is the first time in history where an administration has proposed a budget that doesn't balance in the 10-year window. Um, and CBO is saying, oh, no, it's, it's actually worse, even worse than, than what you're uh, saying, than, right? than, 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 <laughs> than what you think. Yeah, no, it's, it's horrific. You could say a lot of bad things about Bill Clinton, but at least the guy balanced things out and actually was running some surpluses at a certain point. I mean, we, you know, I, I just don't see how this can continue. I mean, quite honestly, uh, I mean, cause it can't, I mean, you, the, the math just does not, I know people say, well, you can't treat a government as if it's a household or a business budget, yada, yada, yada. But the bottom line is math is still math. You can't continue to borrow so much that you're actually borrowing money to continue to pay past debt let alone continuing the operation of whatever it is that you're doing. I mean, it, it just makes no sense whatsoever in the long run. Well, and, 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 and the interest expense, I mean, just the, the way, the way you, one way to focus on it is just the interest of the expense, the interest expense from all this debt we're accruing. And this, this is even assuming interest rates don't rise and they're, and they're going to, 
but but even assuming they don't rise, the interest expense it has uh, is is going to overtake the military budget as as the, the amount of, of 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 money that we're that we're paying just to pay off interest it just to pay off interest uh, on the debt we've accumulated is going to overtake the military budget and is going to overtake um, all discretionary spending within the ten year window and, so, we're, and, and, we're, we're, <laughs> and we're still borrowing fifty thousand dollars a second so I mean other than that it's no big deal yeah it's so it's so the, so go back to the analogy of what we're doing to our kids. Not only are we are we sticking them with the credit card debt, we've maxed out the credit card when we give it to them. So so here here's you know we spent all this money, we 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 got all these great things for for my generation. I you know I got the new living room, I got the new car, I got the new you know four by four, I got all sorts of all sorts of uh, of new things. Here's the credit card, Johnny. Uh, uh, you're going to get stuck with the bill. Oh, and by the way, I maxed out the credit card. Well, I used up all of the <laughs> all of our borrowing capacity, and so you got to pay the interest. You got to pay it all off, and you don't get to do you don't get to borrow anymore for yourself because if you do, the interest is going to be even more. It's just going to overwhelm you. So uh, it, uh, I'll, it, it, I'll go you one better. Not only did we do that, we also obligated them to continue to borrow more money to pay off some of the other stuff that we had going on on top of it, maintenance and everything else. We've continued to obligate them not only to pay all this, but also to continue to borrow more money just to live on what's going on right. I mean, it's it's insane. It is literally the definition of insanity. Yeah, this generation has certainly failed. I mean, it, 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 we we've achieved in 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 some respects, but we have failed the next generation in terms of fiscal responsibility. We have piled up debt to make our lives better. Um, and and we're just kicking the cost down the road, and and that takes us back to 331. I mean, that's exactly what we've done at the state level uh, with 331. We've piled up this debt to to maybe get a few more jobs out of it in terms of current uh, activity, but uh, if you look at the prospects, it's not going to pay off, uh, pay returns that 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 offset the impact of what we've done to the next generation. So monkey see, monkey do. Uh, it's going to be a bad situation. Uh, federally, nationally, uh, when we come to October uh, in the middle of an election cycle. Not sure what's going to happen at that point. Brad Keithley has been our guest. Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget is the is the uh, group. If you've been uh, uh, following him, you could basically see everything that's been going on in the Alaska uh, economy with oil and gas, the legislature, and more. Uh, appreciate you coming on, Brad. Thank you so much for all that you do. Final thoughts here as we wrap up? Well... <laughs> We got to change the players, Michael. We got to go back to your your charter of change. Uh, the only way we're going to stop going down this road uh, is to change the players, uh, become more fiscally responsible, uh, uh, not do things like 331, uh, and uh, and and get our spending uh, under control as a state. So, I think every show you and I are going to do, we're going to end up talking about that charter of change. Change the players. That's what is at stake in this in this election cycle. Right, absolutely. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on board and joining us. We appreciate you being part of the program. As always, uh, thanks for coming on. We will uh, we will talk to you again next week. Michael, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.